A group of adventurers is facing an invincible S-rank forest dragon in a forest. Not only are they on the losing end, but they suck too, like they can't even leave a scratch on the beast. It spits out a scorching flame that takes out nearly all the surrounding greenery. In the face of such a hopeless situation, the party is forced to run away. Now, in other cozier news, a young man named Al Wayne is farming in a peaceful field. He notices streaks of lightning and wonders if it's going to rain. Then he shifts his attention to the glistening eggplants, which signify the success of his experiment with new fertilizers. Enough with the eggplant emojis, ladies. This is what the real thing looks like. After harvesting them, Al receives a notification saying, Soil turning completed, level 10. This impresses his friend, Testa, who is a professional fisherman. But get this, Al's recently increased his fishing skills to level 10, which is already higher than Testa's. This isn't the flashiest thing we could be talking about, but hey, it's honest work. Al's attributes these to his blessing, Growth Boost, which accelerates his level up process. Now aside from his sick farming skills, his attack power is pretty strong at a whopping 73,612 points. After a bit, Al bids farewell to his friend in a rush to deliver his fresh produce to the capital. Al comes across a flying dragon. It boasts of thick scales and powerful firepower that promises destruction to all that crosses its way. The beast is out for the kill, and it's chasing down the helpless adventurers scrambling to escape. Instead of fleeing, Al decides to throw a carrot at it to throw the dragon's attention and buy time for the others to escape. Surprisingly, the seemingly harmless carrot causes a huge explosion and one-shots the ferocious dragon. Freaking pack it up, Saitama, there's a new guy in town. Now the adventurers are dumbstruck and wonder what the heck just happened. Could this be Al's incredible attack power? Either way, he nonchalantly leaves it at that and continues on with his journey. Upon arriving at the royal capital's gates, a horse-riding kidnapper and his victim comes across Al's path, and without a second thought, he rescues the woman and pulls her away. The kidnapper attacks him with a dagger, but Al effortlessly disarms and incapacitates him. There isn't even a single scratch on his handsome mug. When fighting Al, the biggest mistake you could make is fighting him in the first place. He has the power of perception, which allowed him to evade the man's attacks as the world moves slowly with it on. With the criminal being taken away, the woman thanks Al for saving her. And with all that said and done, Al finally delivers his produce and sets out to leave the capital. But suddenly, the city guards block his way. It turns out that the pretty woman he saved earlier is the first princess of the royal capital of Magus, Fall East Magus. This shocks Al to his core, but while he's trying to speak formally to her, she commands him to speak casually. The princess then makes a direct request. She wants him to serve the royal family. Oh boy, seriously? Al just wants to be a farmer, man. He really wants to decline, but he knows that if he does, it's to the gallows for him. Still, Al politely declines the offer, and before he could skedaddle out of the scene, the princess grabs him by the shirt, cause why would he turn down such a high paying job? To this, Al declares, uh, I do care about that, I only want to work on the fields my whole life. Okay, so if that's the case, then Fallis proceeds to bribe him with a 33,000 square meter field all to himself. This calms Al down a bit, and he proceeds to ask why they want to recruit him anyway. Easy. The status of the man he just fought with is usually as high as 500 points. Generally, an ordinary person's average status is 50 points. Adventurers top out at 130 points, and esteemed knights or captains can reach 600 points. The one and only legendary hero has 1,000 points. She asks if he can show her his status. Now, remembering that his status is around 65,000 or the equivalent of 65 legendary heroes, he definitely can't let her or anyone else see it. Cause like, he's a walking hack and even has the plot armor to prove it. Remember the adventurers who were running away from the forest dragon earlier? Well, they have arrived and relay that the forest dragon was blown up by someone else with a mysterious and powerful weapon. Well, do they know it was actually just a carrot? They went to the source of the blast to figure out who did it, but they only found the trails of a carriage in its wake. 
Ballas is quick-witted enough to deduce that the person who defeated the dragon just might be Al. However, he's also quick on his feet and runs out of the scene before she can even ask. Curses! She'll get him next time. The palace is receiving reports of large swarms of monsters that are already closing in on Magus. It's a united monster front consisting of orcs, dragons, golems, and pixies, but there's just one thing. It seems like they're being controlled. According to a witness, it looks like a second coming of Hellzone, the hellish invasion. The king says that it is impossible since Macbeth the Demon King and leader of Hellzone should have been killed in battle by a hero. They have also made a peace pact with the demons to prevent those events from ever happening again. Officer Cecil steps forward, admitting that not all demons have accepted the pact. He thinks this is an act of vengeance by the demons who hate them for defeating the Demon King. This time, Hellzone's leader should be Romeo Van Dead, who only proposed the peace pact to catch the human race off guard. The dragon's attack and the princess's kidnapping are merely distractions. So the enemies probably have noticed that the hero who has defeated the Demon King has passed away, leaving the capital defenseless. Officer Cecil urges the king and princess to run away from the royal capital. The king resolves to stay in the palace to suffer with his people instead of running away. Officer Cecil applauds his efforts to take responsibility but insists the rest of the soldiers convince the king to escape. Such a brilliant leader must be preserved no matter what. Meanwhile, Al arrives home after a long and exhausting journey. He forgets to hold back when opening the door, so he ends up, well, ripping the doorknob into shreds. Whatever, he can fix it some other time, I guess. Suddenly, Testa comes knocking, unable to open the Naba's door. A panicky Testa explains that an army of monsters is passing by the village. They must run away immediately. Al doesn't seem too concerned at first, but when he realizes that his crops might get involved, his tune promptly changes. His crops! His babies! The monsters could just mindlessly destroy them. So, like us, Al runs like the wind. But unlike us, he is running towards the monsters, not from them. Now when he arrives at the field, he is relieved to find that his crops are safe. He observes the monsters passing by his village from a safe distance. They aren't looking to harm anything in their way. Okay, cool. But just as he's considering doing nothing about it, he considers that his livelihood might still get affected by this. If the world capital falls into ruins, his customer base would be wiped out. <gasps> The horror. Meanwhile, the king and princess Fallas follow Cecil's lead to a secret shortcut, which turns out to be a dead end. Out of nowhere, he attacks the king and eliminates the other royal soldiers. Cecil turns out to be a traitor and reveals his true form, a demon none other than Romeo Van Dead himself. He then imitates the king's appearance using his magic with a plan to take over the role after tonight's events. This way, the demons can occupy the royal capital of Magus without the people realizing it. Romeo fires an earth-shattering blast, and the father-daughter duo uses the last of their powers to conjure a shield to block it. They're barely hanging on, but Romeo unleashes a magic beast that shatters the shield. With the king and princess defenses completely broken, it seems like all hope is lost. But not on else, ho! He comes running into their aid, using nothing but a hoe to excavate a gigantic hole that all monsters fall into. Al stands before the powerful demon, hoe in hand, fully intent on facing Romeo head on. Romeo asks who he is, to which Al replies that he's a farmer. But like, how can a farmer even dodge that move? Well, Al breaks down his move called deep plowing, which is a technique he used on Romeo's mom last night. Well, kidding aside, deep blowing replaces the soil on the surface with soil from a deeper layer. Using the same soil will reduce the nutrition and microbes in the soil, so the plants will tend to get sick. Welcome to Farming 101 with Al Wayne, everyone. Unfortunately, the demon seems uninterested in this educational lecture on maximizing agricultural produce and its positive effects on the economy. Hey Romeo, if you're gonna be king, you have to know that. So the demon loses his patience and attempts to attack Al from behind. Al, however, just catches the blade with his bare hands and sends the demon flying straight into the mountain face. This ticks Romeo off and he eats all his subordinates to unleash his true form, a high-ranking demon. 
Speechless upon seeing Romeo's stats, Phallus urges Al to run. It's an unwinnable fight. Romeo attacks Al, but the extraordinary farmer simply defeats him with a single punch, all while having a full head of hair. After witnessing such a display, the rest of the demons flee in terror. The very next day, Al is called to the palace. Princess Phallus thanks him for saving her and the king. The country, the people, and the king's retainers are all safe as a result of his efforts. Al admits that he just didn't want his vegetables to get damaged or lose the only place to sell them. Well, he isn't a valiant hero after all. He's just as powerful as 65 of them. Follows giggles. The king then asks if he's willing to serve the country and he immediately refuses with the line, No, I'm only a farmer. But the king pleads. Apparently, Al alone is equivalent to having 100 people. Any title Al desires could be his if he just says the word. Fall is tells her dad that it won't work since Al isn't interested in any position or honor. As expected, Al declines as politely as he can. I'm sorry. I've made up my mind to be a farmer all my life. A lucrative offer is then proposed by Fallis. Al can still have the 33,000 square meter plot of land in exchange for registering at the guild and occasionally accepting monster subjugation quests from the palace. Al agrees, shaking hands to these very fair terms. Or are they really? When he arrives at the gifted plot of real estate, it turns out to be a dry, barren wasteland. Ha! You win, princess. Al and Fallis find themselves strolling around the town market. While marveling at the produce, he asks if a princess like her can just wander anywhere she wants without any repercussions. To which she claps back that learning about the commoner's way of life is her duty to the people. A servant is acting as her body double at the palace anyways. She leads him to the adventurer's guild. Fallis reminds him to call her Philia while they're out in town. The accessory in her hair is imbued with deception magic, so her true identity is hidden to other people. Now when they get in, a man immediately recognizes Al as the one in the rumors. He excitedly leads him to the adventurer registration area where Al prepares to sign up. However, before he can even register, his stomach lets out a deafening grumble. Helen, the woman at the booth, treats him to her specialty the kabosa fruit pie. His hunger is now satiated and they begin a proper conversation. She seems to be curious why he wanted to register as an adventurer when he was already a farmer. His story is that he received farmland from a certain person with the condition that he would subdue monsters when needed. His main occupation and passion will always be a farmer, and with the adventurer role as a side job. The adventurers from earlier's encounters with the s rank forest dragon enter the building and validate that Al was the one who defeated the monster. In one hit, no less. Sadly, Al's plan of staying low-key are fizzing away as everyone hears and gathers to take a look. The bald adventurer introduces himself as Jake, the woman is Lamia, and the man with long hair is Luke. Now Helen recommends asking these friendly veterans for help should he feel lost, and they seem happy to have him. Al will start with G rank which is the lowest starting point for new adventurers. The top double S rank is for heroes gifted with the skills from birth, so realistically one can aim for S rank with hard work. Now according to Helen, his talents could hasten his progression to S rank, but Al internally decides to settle for A rank or below so as to not stand out. Helen gives him an easy quest for starters, gathering essential milk grass from the forest. Strangely, when she hears that he doesn't have money for armaments yet, she gives him a magic robe imbued with defensive power to protect himself. It looks a little valuable so he attempts to refuse but she won't take no for an answer. Awestruck by his respectable appearance with it on, she mentions it's nostalgic but cuts the topic off and wishes him the best of luck. Fallis and Al then leave the guild. Due to the dangers lurking in the forest, Al admits he definitely can't take the princess there. So they part ways and she assures him that she'll come see him again the following day, fully confident in his abilities to wake up to a new morning. Now in the forest, Al stumbles upon a scale on the ground but gets charged at by a female orc before he can study it further. The monster is in heat and wants to mate now. 
she grabs him and is about to do her worst when he is luckily saved by Jay, who happens to be in the area with the other two from the guild. Now Al recollects himself and shows them the scale. Luke identifies it as part of a rare unidentified monster that's been spotted in the forest of Grimm recently. No one knows what it is, but the others suggest that the scale would likely sell high on the market. The sun begins to set which prompts Al to finish collecting the final stock for his quest. Suddenly, a menacing aura envelops the forest and a black dragon emerges from the trees, leaving the adventurers frozen in horror. The dragon simply walks past them and its stats are through the roof, so this is where the scales come from. That night, Helen wakes up from a bad dream in cold sweat. Fast forward to the next day at the guild, an old woman named Juan notices that Helen doesn't look so well. Helen confesses her predicament. She lost her memory again. She has no recollection of what happened after she went home yesterday. Now worried, Juan theorizes that this could be because of Helen's unhealthy work ethic and recommends that she go home. Sadly, Al arrives right at this time like a customer coming into a restaurant two minutes before closing. There's a valid reason though, he reports the encounter with the harrowing beast in the forest. Helen takes him and the others to see the guild master right away. There, they relay that there's a black dragon in the forest of Grimm, with an unparalleled attack power of 230,000. That's enough to vaporize an entire country. The black dragon goes by the name Malevolent Dragon Ouroboros, a name that sends Helen to the ground in disgust. After Helen regains her composure, Jake suggests that it would be best to close off the forest of Grimm right away. Al takes out the dragon's scale which triggers some traumatic memories within Helen. She remembers her younger brother being slaughtered by a dragon. At this point, she finally passes out. Later that day, Al is seen waiting in the room for an update on Helen's condition. One, Helen's adoptive parent, tells him that she simply fainted. Apparently, Helen doesn't have her memories of when she was little and all she remembers from back then is her name. The robe she gave Al was the only thing she had when Juan and her husband found her unconscious by the Sness River 15 years ago. They decided to adopt her since it didn't seem like she had any relatives. Ever since then, she hasn't been able to remember her past at all. Juan wonders if it's somehow connected to the dragon Ouroboros. Al offers to look more into the monster which worries Juan since he's merely a G-rank adventurer. Now teeming with resolve, Al assures her that he'll be fine. He won't be going to the Forest of Grimm right away. The first step will be to gather information by asking around and visiting the library. The old woman gives him some recovery potions in lieu of an advance payment. She tells him to report to her if he does find anything and that she'll give him a reward for it. Al is set out to leave, but receives a delivery out of nowhere. Huh, a letter from his mom? The well-dressed postman introduces himself as Reeks, but more importantly, how did his parents or the postman know where he was? Now let's get to the library for some research. Al goes over countless books and laments that with an attack power of 230,000, it would make an SS ranks 1000 look puny. Cause like, not even he can take it down alone. So since Juan found Helen 15 years ago, he decides to look over the damage reports around that time. The main issue now is that the librarian does not give him access to these, for only people of a specific rank and above have access to the damage reports. But wait, Follows comes to the rescue. The librarian is shocked to see the princess in the library, much less casually conversing with Al on equal terms. She even admits to look around town for him, then asks the librarian if she can permit Al access to the damage reports under her authority. The librarian quickly switches gears and grants them permission. They finally reach the right book discussing the village of Honol, thanks to false knowledge. Al intently browses through its pages, admitting that he just can't ignore someone who's in trouble right in front of him. According to the records, the village of Honol was wiped out 15 years ago. A certain itinerant trader visited the village in order to stock up on goods, only to find nothing but a mercilessly destroyed mountain of rubble. At the site, some scales were left behind, which the investigators concluded might belong to the feared malevolent dragon Ouroboros that had supposedly died a long time ago. This seemingly immortal dragon ingest ruin and despair to prolong its life, but due to the battle with its one and only natural enemy, the benevolent dragon Mirage, it was put to death as recorded in the natural history books. Fall worldly states, despite that, why are the scales of the malevolent dragon lying around? If the malevolent dragon has revived in the present, then 
this world will be in danger. With these details in mind, Al comes to a conclusion. The dragon's now a closely guarded secret in order to not throw the people into disorder. Fall is stunned, since even she, a member of royalty, didn't know about this at all. The logical next step now is to investigate the ruins, and Fall surprisingly volunteers to accompany our MC. Smile and they hear the danger away. And so they get going the following day. There's nothing but torn down houses. Amidst the piercing emptiness, Al hears the voice of a young boy, urging him to come his way and follows it. The voice emerges from a young boy standing by a tombstone. Al and the boy talk a bit, but it seems that Fall can't see or hear him. This young boy, introducing himself as Rai, must be a g -g 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 ghost. Rai admits that he's patiently been waiting here for a person who could hear his voice. He then notices that he and Al both wear the same robe, which the latter explained was a gift from Helen. The ghost is unsurprised, since it was the very same one he wore when he was still alive. Al puts two and two together, pulling Fall into the robe as well. She's initially flustered, asking if this is what couples do together, but her mood changes when she sees the floating apparition. His legs! They're transparent! He's floating! Al covers her mouth and lets Rai continue. Rai says, I think Big Sis is still safe. Helen is my big sister, and she's also the village's sole survivor. Al mentions that Helen doesn't have memories of her past, to which Rai replies her mind subconsciously sealed away the memories because of the unbearable pain and unbearable trauma. It's understandable, but Helen is in grave danger for that very same reason. So Rai begs Al to save his big sister before it's too late. Let's travel back to the past. Back to Helen's childhood when her village was not yet in shambles. She's in the forest calling out to Rai and finds him practicing his swordsmanship. Suddenly, the atmosphere turns grim and the village glows in burning red flames. Helen and Rai rush towards the village, only to find the malevolent dragon Ouroboros rampaging upon the poor townspeople. The two kids assess the situation and surmise that there's nothing that they can do about it. They decide to run away, but Ouroboros sees and mercilessly chases after them. Helen trips and falls to the ground, but before she can get back up, Ouroboros lands right behind her. Rai throws the dagger he has at Ouroboros and manages to strike its eye. A glimmer of hope for Helen to escape opens up, but is quickly extinguished when the dragon instantly recovers. In its annoyance, Ouroboros decides to eat Rai first. Rai is now gravely injured, with the dragon clamoring about how human despair fills him with power. A hopeless Helen holds a blood-soaked Rai in her arms. Ouroboros then declares that he'll keep her alive and come back after 15 years to kill her along with the rest of the community she's in. Rai, despite his weakened state, bravely retorts that he won't give up in protecting his sister even after death. The dragon then allows Rai's soul to remain in that land as a witness to his sister's fate 15 years into the future. As Ouroboros disappears, Rai passes away in Helen's arm. All and Fall hear all about what happened to the village of Honol, directly from Rai himself. Rai shares that whenever Ouroboros annihilates a village or city, it always leaves one survivor. Then after it sleeps for a time, the sole survivor shares the haunting tale to everyone else. This creates a pool of fear over time. Then the dragon awakens to find the survivor to finish the job and prey on the terrified locals as well. The gruesome process just repeats over and over again. Rai adds that Ouroboros' consciousness flowed into him when he was eaten and that's how he found out the secret behind it. The dragon feasts on fear to increase its power. It's now aiming for Helen and the people around her. And he wants Al to stop it somehow. After all, Today's the 15th year anniversary. Al understands but sadly admits that his own powers don't stand a chance against Ouroboros. Rai replies, In that case, you shouldn't give it power. The dragon uses the soul's negative energy as nourishment to live. It's not just about killing. If you hit it with the opposite power of despair, then the dragon's power should weaken. We had a problem and now we have a solution. Thank goodness. Rai asks them to pass what he's about to say on to Helen. Then the scene cuts. After their encounter with Rai, all carries fall while running at a blistering pace. Ah, uh, horse power? No. Al power? Yes. She asks if he can at least carry her like a princess. No can do, it's faster to hold her like a sack of rice or a fresh harvest. 
Now they finally arrive at the capital and get to work. Fall commits to supervising the soldiers and the evacuation of the people within the castle. At the tavern, Juan knocks on Helen's door to check on her, only to find the room empty. Unfortunately, Helen is actually in the dark forest, armed with just a dagger. She comes face to face with a fearsome Ouroboros. The sight of the dragon brings back her traumatic memories of Rai. The dragon taunts her, making her feel guilty for her dear little brother's death. Helen places the dagger just a few inches away from her neck, and Ouroboros feasts on her despair. The sky darkens even more, which has Fall worried for Al. While Helen's ready to end it all, or just herself, as the greedy dragon will go for the townspeople either way, luckily, Al arrives just in time to stop her. He tanks a direct hit from an angry Ouroboros thanks to the cloak's defensive power. The dragon is enraged. Are you even human? Now overflowing with courage, Al punches Ouroboros straight to the chin. The dragon stumbles and admits that Al must be pretty good to have gone an attack through to him. In a reassuring tone, Al tells Helen to stand back and she sees Rai in him. Okay, don't worry Al, Helen shippers, there's still the sweet home Alabama route. Now the farmer and dragon engage in an all-out brawl. Ouroboros has the slight edge due to those explosive fireballs. Al gets pushed back but does not suffer any serious injuries. He pulls Helen by the hand and they run. As they sprint away, Helen cries confessing that she doesn't want anyone else to die because of her. He tries to reassure her that it isn't her fault, but at this point, she thought of self-blame has taken deep roots into her mind, especially her brother's demise. All finally admits that he met Rai earlier that day. He passes on Rai's message for her. I don't regret that I was able to save Big Sis' life. Besides, if she was able to survive, then it's her duty to become happy on everyone's behalf. Make sure you live happily, and let me be proud that I was able to save you, Big Sis. Now continuing his passionate speech, Al implores her to never give up on any situation. He has come to deliver hope. They can turn the tables as long as they never give up. This is precisely Ouroboros' weak spot, optimism, or hope. Everything is falling apart for the dragon, as lights puncture the sky to illuminate the landscape. Al then notices that the dragon's stats are only a fraction of what they were earlier. It's just as Rai expected. Ouroboros feeds on people's despair and changes that into power. Hope can take that away. The dragon comes in for a final swoop, but Al counters with a decisive blow to end it, and with just one hit, the dragon falls. Everything is fine, and now that the dragon is no more, Helen approaches to check on his wounds. But before Al even knew what hit him, he realizes that he has a new one. The man is left speechless as Helen's dagger pierces through his flesh, drawing blood. She watches him with a cruel smile. While he's scrambling to process just what the hell is happening, is this really Helen? Al can't believe it. She's taunting him, relishing in him dropping his recovery potion. Taking advantage of his weakened state, Helen lunges towards Al, but before the worst could befall him, Helen's charge is disrupted by a massive creature. So, you've awakened, Helen screams out. Standing before them is none other than the benevolent dragon Mirage. Al is even more confused, so the white dragon tells him to keep his wits about him. He reveals that Helen has been possessed by Ouroboros, leaving all stunned. Good part, Helen didn't betray him. Bad part, there's a legendary evil dragon in her body. No, no. All this guy really wants is to become a farmer and spends his whole life peacefully tending to his crops. One good deed led to another, and now he's a part-time adventurer deemed as one of the strongest in the city. That's a fact recognized by even the royal family. This sounds great and all, but this is a total nightmare for someone who's just trying to stay under the radar. He may not have the answer as to why things are happening the way they are, but one thing is certain. His world is slowly expanding, and there is still a lot more that is waiting to be discovered by our local farmer turned reluctant hero. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.